Today is the fourth day of the July-August 1985 seven-day retreat. Two different things that were said in meetings come to mind. And we will begin with those. Using what was said as a starting point to look together. One person remarked that was not the main thing that was said, it was a remark among other things. And again, I want to say, I don't remember verbatim what people say. They have been put slightly differently. The person said, your sashins are getting weaker all the time. For that person, it was not funny. And since many other things were said and we talked about other things, we didn't go into this thing and I'll go into it now. Not knowing what precisely this person meant. But there was was another remark by, made by another person, an implication, not a direct remark, an implication that there isn't the joriki that there used to be. Something like that. Joriki, for people who are not familiar with this term, Japanese word, which I think refers to the energy created by an especially, an especially intense practice of Zazen. And this energy is creatable with systems and devices. One device being a stick with which people are hit increasingly relentlessly with encouragement talks, a taut atmosphere of discipline, pressure to sit day and night, etc. Rushes to meetings, being pushed and pressured and yet maybe being rebuked at the other end. All of this creating what is called jariki, an energy which may very likely also have the energy of fear in it. Because fear is an energy. Tremendous energy. We talked about it in our talk about fear, how the body is made ready to run, to run or to attack. All stops are pulled, off, are pulled out. All systems, glandular, organismic, muscular in the, in the body are go. If one participates in such a system, that energy is palpable. One is part of it. And maybe one has never known such energy before or since. One is no longer participating in it.
Some people have described it as the whole body feeling electrified. If one lives one's daily life feeling fatigued, maybe already when one wakes up in the morning, maybe from conflict with work and relationship or the drudgery of a work that one does not care for. And exhausted at night coming home from work, then this energy seems like a remedy like a, a tremendous boost to the system. May or may not. But definitely it's palpable, it's feelable. The energy itself this jariki energy that can be created by systems and devices. It does not aid in understanding itself. What it does for one, how one becomes addicted to it, how in it, the self which craves it or wants it is strengthened by attachment to it, by wanting it again. <coughs> if that is the case, one may also never want it again. <laughs> the energy in itself does nothing to aid in understanding oneself. It is goal-directed, and motivated. It is channeled tightly in what is called one's practice. It is a fragmented energy because it is channeled, it is exclusive, anything else that may be going on and does not lead to understanding its very self and the one who experiences it, wants it, craves it, is attached to it or is, it gets sick from it. And eventually, of course, if the system is left, when it's out of it again, it fizzles out. At times with the pendulum swinging to the other extreme, periods of tremendous low exhaustion, depression following. This is not speculation on my part. It does have that effect. If one has been told and read that this is what is necessary for spiritual practice, that this is one of the basic ingredients of it, and one has come to believe it, then of course one misses it and doubts whether without that what is called spiritual practice is possible. Or one may feel one's practice weakening because this energy is missing. Or one will see it. <coughs> the retreat as a whole getting weaker as it was expressed by this person.
when one looks outside, takes a walk through the woods, up the hill, down the other side, with this teeming growth of grass and trees and birds, the hot sun in the summer and then a sudden cloud burst with its downpour. Where does that energy come from? Because if one thinks in terms of authority and creator, one will say, God has created it. God is the source of it and he has devised it all. But this is belief which is not tested in one's own experience. Mm. I don't think anybody doubts or can question that life is teeming energy. A volcano like Mount St. Helen erupts and the whole countryside for square miles around is totally changed. Why does one feel cut off from the energy of life? And then seek energy in a system with devices and methods. That is one question. The other question is, is there an energy which is not channeled, which is not partial, but which is whole? to which one can be open, of which one is part, which is not induced, produced, which doesn't fizzle out when one removes oneself from a certain location or person or system. to explore such questions one has to observe with the greatest of care and interest. Interest is too weak a word. With a passion. What it is in one's life that drains energy constantly from moment to moment. And I think if one watches, because the interest, the passion is there to understand this human life, realizing the way it is going is degenerating. If one observes, because one realizes the need to do so, one will understand where energy is wasted in endless conflicts throughout the day, in escapes, endless escapes. In talking, gossiping, either with other people or internally. Mostly about others.
Maybe one does too many things because one does not want to face a mind that is not occupied with something and there's exhaustion from that. Maybe one wants more and more money so one has to take more and more jobs. Not being able to say no because the image doesn't allow one to say no so taking on obligations that one cannot fulfill considering the fact how many things one already has to do. So it is, it is open for observation, like anything else, how energy is drained and wasted and leaks in one's daily life. And from that, the craving for energy. May be supplied by drink, drugs, or excitement, sexual excitement, or movie excitement, TV, video. Sort of plug oneself into in to some system of energy, not to feel this drainedness. Yet, the amazing thing is that energy surrounds us. Actually, one is never completely drained because for some strange reason the heart keeps pumping. And all the processes that are going on physiologically, these amazing, wondrous processes still go on. They may suffer from constant exhaustion. But something is still, not just something, it's a whole universe of processes in, in this body. And there is this energy of nature from which one is quite capsuled away in the city, except when there's a tremendous thunderstorm or Maybe when the power lines break down, one gets an inkling of it, or a tornado rips houses apart. The surf coming in when one lives at the ocean side. Is that something <coughs> which has nothing to do with this organism here? Is that something separate? unrelated. Or is one isolated from it through one's thoughts and ideas of what one is, what one should have and needs, through one's attachments, addictions. All of this, see, all of this, without exception, is totally open for and for free inquiry. What one actually is from moment to moment. And once this inquiry begins, it gains a momentum. Because what is seen to be actually so, to be actually, truly so, within or without, liberates. Liberates from unconscious compulsion. Habitual compulsion. Insight has that power. To liberate. One really sees an attachment for what it is, for what it does, and for what it can't do, namely produce security. That one has expected the impossible. <coughs> then maybe that attachment, which is so draining, 
so fear-producing, one is always afraid of losing what one is attached to. Maybe that will dissolve in the inside. And with the dissolution of any attachment or blind habit, there comes energy. It is almost as though what is seen, be it a fear or anger or an attachment, gives up its energy to attention. A habit of tensing a hand or the mouth or some kind of a tensing in the body, if, it, if it's seen in stillness without trying to modify it, to get rid of it, to relax it, just seeing it may instantly relax it. And then there's energy, the energy that was bound up and tied in this habit. Unbeknownst to one, these things run automatic if there's no attention. So here we are all the time in the process of creating a place where people can inquire and look and question or just sit in still attention without creating a new conditioning grafted upon all of our old conditioning. not only without creating a new conditioning, but maybe bringing to light this conditioned mind so that it may uncondition itself without stress. I mean imposed stress, imposed discipline, imposed force, because all of that conditions the mind. One may find in a powerfully organized retreat that one functions so energetically, but one may not find, unless one looks very critically, that one has become conditioned to it, that it has conditioned the mind. Even if one leaves it, one still finds the mind has been conditioned. This is all open to, to insight. Now, here too we may create or perpetuate conditioning. This is for each person to look into by himself or herself and to be aware of it. We have reduced the number of clappers, and we will have no more clappers, a few bells. And yet, maybe having a bell tell one what to do at a certain time may be a conditioning influence. Even as few bells as there are, one has to watch it. I was recently talking to a person who was a long-standing member of another Zen center. who told me that she had a sort of a dream, I don't know whether it was a daydream or a night dream, wishing she's no longer a member of that center. But there was this dream-like wish that there would be bells to tell her what to do. Beautiful, different bells telling her what to do each moment of the day. So one cannot take lightly even the sound of the bells. Or let's say, take it for granted that they will not, will not condition the mind to be aware if this happens. And of course, here where the bells don't tell one what to do, they just signal what is happening, one doesn't have to come in here. But 
Does one feel guilty if one hears the bell and goes the other direction, namely out into the woods? A number of people have told me that. The first time they were leaving the building when the bell sounded or the, the wooden block, as one person put it, when I was putting my shoes on where everybody else was taking them off, I was feeling guilty or uncomfortable. But she just had to go. She couldn't sit in here. She had to go someplace else to be alone with anger or whatever it was. Sit it out alone without any support whatsoever from anybody. So is it possible in an open space, inside or out, it doesn't have to be in a hall, can be any place, to open up to whatever is going on inside or out, without any resistance, any craving for something better? to leave alone the memories of different times in different places and different experiences, to, to drop that, because that is precisely the, the stopper, which the, the, the shade in front of the window, the block in front of the door. No matter how strong the nostalgia for old times, Can one see it? Can one even see it as taking place and what it is? How it affects one, how it isolates one from what is taking place now, from what actually is this instant, the truth of it. Not the memory of what was, but the truth of what is. in the discovery of what is there is boundless energy. It isn't induced or produced or figured out. It's there. And it's a mystery where it comes from. It doesn't come from any place. Because there's no space between here and there. There's no in-between. There's only this wholeness of life of which one is an integral part, even though the deluded mind says, I am a separate individual, pursuing separate goals, separate interests, which channels the energy into small, separate, self-centered channels. This can be observed. That's the beauty of it. Not with a prejudiced mind, not if one is prejudiced against selfishness and already has the idea, I should be unselfish, then one cannot observe. One will look the other way when selfishness is blatantly there. But to see it and understand it with a mind that is still free from prejudice, judgment, memories of better times or worse times, all of that being a waste of energy. Then the truth of this moment reveals itself. Or the falseness of the conditioning, the danger of it, the narrowing or the thwarting of energy of our conditioning. to look for our energy and guidance and inspiration to systems and authorities and teachers who will do this thing for us. 
They won't. They can't. The greatest of teachers have said, be a light unto yourself. Maybe just a candlelight, a little glowing ember, but not looking to systems and others to plug into, because this is addiction. And with that, the human mind and body, which are inseparable, starts to atrophy, to degenerate. Because only if one looks and inquires and questions and thinks for oneself, does this body-mind stay alert and alive and healthy? With the possibility of real, thoroughgoing change in which not all the patterns laid down in the past and the unconscious mind rule us, but we're seeing now what is going on, is the action, brings the action. Which brings me to the other thing that was mentioned in a, in a meeting where a person said, the more I look and see the way I function, the way my mind functions, the more everything slips away from me. And I find there's literally nothing that I can even put a toe on. And that is scary. I see in my job there was so much desire for power in it. In the family, I, I see much clearer the family attachments for what they are, and everything I've sought security in. I see I can't find it in there, so there's nothing. It seems like floating in space with nothing to hold on to. What we were talking about is, what is the scariness then? Isn't it already verbalizing to oneself the state and then getting scared at what one puts to oneself verbally? I've, I've got nothing to hold on to, there's nothing, I have nothing to put my toe on. And one sort of visualizes falling through space or falling into a black hole, all of this Again, the manufacture, the product of thought and imagination. And away from this crucial state of having a toehold nowhere and seeing the fallacy of attachment, the illusoriness of attachment, and the danger of it, and that it doesn't hold what it has promised. Can one remain with that? Having no, nothing to hold on to and not begin to think about it, just allow it to be there, to live with it, to live out of it, and to watch carefully 
how quickly the mind wants to create a handle, a railing, someplace. To say, oh, oh Christ, oh Buddha, then there's a railing. And this other thing can be put aside. One doesn't need to face it. And yet what one holds on to is thought and concept and idea. And not a light unto oneself. It's trusting someone else to uphold one. Which conditions the mind. So the mind is not free to inquire anymore. And look, it is just sheltered, but not out in, in the open space where there's the energy of life. Life. Can one, can one live with this feeling of insecurity <coughs> without cr constantly creating new securities. We've never done it. Or have we? Has one. It's a new way of being. mind holds on to nothing. It's really free to be, to see, to perceive, and to act appropriately, instantly, when action is needed, and to be quiet when it is not needed. No toehold any place, no handle any place means being nobody. And not out of this anxiety of being nobody once one tells oneself I'm nobody. Because the anxiety doesn't come when one doesn't verbalize it. When one doesn't verbalize it and there's truly no one there, then there's everything in its fullness and wholeness. energy that is not cut up, not divided or channeled. So, can one really be nobody and not quickly want to become somebody again? Or if this process takes place as it does automatically with a heavily conditioned mind, can it be seen and stop in the seeing. no system in this at all. Can't be.
We will end here for today.